Hi everyone, it's Lisa with Medmark and welcome to Doc Talk. Today we are so privileged to have Dr. Thomas McClammy with us from North Scottsdale Endodontics and especially privileged for myself because Dr. McClammy and I have about a 10 year history going back together since Doctor of Dentistry days. So yep. um, we're really excited to have him talk with us today and we want to welcome Dr. McClammy. Thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you so much for being here Pleasure with us. Pleasure to see you. You too. So tell us what's been going on with North Scottsdale Endodontics and all of the changes that have taken place here. Well, <clears throat> the one thing that we can count on in life is change. And a lot of change is actually planned. And I have to say, this has been on a more than a 10-year plan and when we moved to this specific spot here in North Scottsdale, it was planned to have an endodontic and an implant practice, but along with that, a teaching institute and a teaching facility. And that plan and that change has now transpired. So I'd say approximately two years ago, we finished with the physical plant next door that has been coined the Horizon Dental Institute. And uh, I would have to say, what's on the horizon. Right, and it's been very successful for you. It's been successful, it's been a challenge, it continues to be a challenge, literally on a regular, almost daily basis. I heard the term recently, everybody's heard 24-7. Uh, I've gotta say mine is like 25-8, and still <laughs> not enough. Right. But it's so all good. Yeah, you've, you've done it for a long time. How, why did you get into endo? Why did you, why did you choose this specialty? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna say that I was, I was a general dentist and when I was going through dental school, endo was probably would have been way down the totem pole as far as the specialty that I would pursue. Uh, I was really into uh, orthodontics. Uh, but during the process of my career as a general dentist, which went 15 years, I got heavily involved in dental reconstruction, you know, the rebuilding the entire mouth, and found during that process that in order to rebuild somebody's mouth, you have to have a good foundation. And that foundation could be a healthy tooth, which means it's got to be a healthy pulp, it could be a tooth that is endodontically treated and it has to be treated well, or it could even be further down the line in the patient's lifetime, a dental implant. So in the process of studying what I can do to create a better foundation, I found myself in Santa Barbara studying with Cliff Ruddle, and he exposed me to things that I never got in dental school, and I felt like wow, I've been cheated. Why didn't I learn this stuff in dental school? This stuff has been known for a long time. And along with that came looking in a microscope and looking inside of a tooth. And when I did that, I went, wow, this is obvious. And I've got to say, I just started a love affair with endo and realized what was possible that was never explained and shown to me in the past, and so I went for it. And I, I suppose I studied with Cliff for about six months, and I called him one day and I said, dude, this has gotten the best of me. I think I wanna go to endo school. <laughs> he said, I could have told you that after one day when you were with me. I went home and I told my wife, Phyllis, I got this guy, he's hooked. You were sold. That's totally sold. Sold on endo. Still love it. Yeah. So speaking of um, microscopes, because I know that's a huge part of your practice. It is. Um, what What's the brand that you, your brand of choice that you prefer? I, I, I started my microscopic career, career in dentistry with Global Surgical, whom I still uh, have a lot of respect for, the company and the people. but. Somewhere along my microscopic journey, and I think it was at the AAE meeting in uh, or, uh, Atlanta, uh, I looked inside of a Zeiss microscope and I had kind of an epiphany, like, wow, this is clear. And then I got exposed not only to the clearness of Zeiss optics, there's just something 
about the feel of what the Germans do. It's kind of like a Mercedes. Like their or, cars, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had the same sort of thing at that time. I look at it in his eyes going, whoa, this is, uh, this is kind of the cat's meow here. Mm -hmm. And then when you get exposed to what I'm going to refer to as the pro ergo microscope, where it's a computerized microscope and you can focus, zoom in, zoom out. You can raise the level of light intensity in and out with simply the push of a button. And you can do it with either hand. It completely catapulted my love affair with scopes even further. So since I started using a microscope in about 1992, I have never treated a tooth without a scope, ever. So I'm, uh, my, my whole dental persona, you might say, <coughs> revolves around being able to see better because you can do better. And when you do better, you feel better. Right. And your patients feel better. Your patients without question. Everyone in the food chain benefits. The first person that benefits is the doctor. The next person is the assistant because he or she can tell immediately you're doing better and you're feeling better. And when you have an assistance microscope, in other words, when you have assistance co-observer tube and binoculars, mm -hmm. that is, pardon me, that assistant can see what you're doing. They get it. The patient feels it almost like an exothermic reaction. And everyone in the food, the, the entire office, it's like a positive wave of energy goes through the entire office to see. Right. Well, it has to, with the technology, it has to speed up the case for you as well. I mean, the efficiency has got to be amazing. The, the, the efficiency and the accuracy and less trauma for the patient, all of those things are huge benefits to treating teeth and tissues, both soft tissue and hard tissue, being bone and tooth structure with, with microscopy. No, no question about it. And so you have the Zeiss Pro Ergo outfitted in all of your operatories? Yes, ma'am, I do. And also in Horizon? We also have a Pro Ergo in, in, uh, in Horizon Dental Institute that we use, and then we also have 10 uh, Pico, Zeiss Pico microscopes, which is a phenomenal microscope as well. It's just not the motorized version. So what other equipment in your practice can't you live without? besides the Zeiss microscopes? There's, there's a lot of things today, and that's, that's, again, we're talking about change. Technology has brought us phenomenal things to use today. I feel like, wow, what do I get to use today? But specifically, I'm gonna answer your question. <coughs> and some years ago, one of your folks with your magazine, Endo Practice, asked us to, to write, asked me to write an article on uh, I think it was an editorial article. And I titled that article, um, Few Things Are As Important As The Truth. And I cited two pieces of technology which have been literally, for me, life-changing. One of them, the microscope, without question. Mm -hmm. And the second has been cone beam technology. Those two things have literally changed how we approach dentistry, how I approach dentistry, and I simply don't want to practice without them. There are other things in the pipeline. There are some things coming on very early on now that we're seeing uh, as far as when we're talking about endodontics with um, disinfection and debridement of root canal systems. I'm, th I'm sure you've heard of Son Endo mm -hmm. in general way. Oh, yes. That's our next big mission that we're on now, and mm -hmm. we've recently installed gentle wave and we're starting to use it on patients. That's awesome. So, so tell me how, um, how endodontics and implantology live in the same world and when and, when and where you decide um, when to place an implant. I like that question. And I like that question a lot and the reason that I do is because you'll see oftentimes endo versus an implant. I really think that's the wrong message. I think the message is, if we can restore and keep the natural tooth, that's the ultimate dental implant without question. Right. But there comes a time, 
with some teeth that the tooth is no longer salvageable. It could be, it can't be restored. It could be that the tooth has been treated, maybe retreated, maybe surgerized. Maybe the tooth has a radicular or a root fracture and we can't save it. Whatever the reason is, who better to make that assessment of whether or not a tooth can be saved or not than an endodontist? Because an endodontist doesn't have to, they can treat the tooth endodontically or endodontists that are trained and trained well to do implants can do an implant. I firmly believe, again, not to be repetitive, but the ultimate dental implants, the natural tooth, if we can keep it healthy. Right. But if we can't keep it healthy, what do we do? And in my opinion, the very best thing is a dental implant. I've placed dental implants since 1983. The only recess that I had from that was the time when I was in graduate school at Boston University. And then I went back into private practice and started placing implants again but only when I could document that the tooth couldn't be saved and when I had my patient on board and in some cases my referral board, my referral doctor on board, that that's what they wanted me to do. So how do you feel these days about um, general practitioners uh, doing root canals, endodontics, and getting into more and more into implant? Are you, are you a fan? I actually am a fan, and a lot of what we're doing in, in Horizon Dental Institute is teaching dentists to do more procedures. I think that, well, the first thing I'm going to say is I don't believe that there are any experts. I just degree, I, I believe there's varying degrees of ignorance. In other, <laughs> words, in other words, those dentists that choose to learn and grow and, and become educated in a certain area, they have every right to do that. It's completely legal and ethical and moral and honest for a dentist to get involved in all the different specialties in dentistry. The difference is if they get trained and they want to do it, there's no reason that they shouldn't do it. And then they should do whatever they feel comfortable and what they have the permission of their patients to do. And it, it really boils down to how do they feel themselves about doing this procedure? And would they do this same procedure on their wife or their husband or their brother or their sister or their mom? And I've, I've done tons of endo on both my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. And I've done lots of implants on mm -hmm. both my mom and my dad before they passed away. I'm a believer in continuing education and I'm a believer in people improving themselves and getting better and therefore having more confidence to do whatever procedures they choose to be. We're the ones that made up this term specialist. So mm -hmm. the specialist is somebody who is trained and if we were to quote Buchanan, if you're going to be a specialist, you need to be doing something special. I love that. Well, education is key. Education I mean is is absolute key. If we stop and continuing we, education, continuing education, not CE. If we stop wanting to learn, then that's a problem. Definitely, you need to be a lifelong journey, a lifelong learner. Right. So, Dr. McClammy, what are your some of your best kept secrets that you could pass on to other specialists and GPs? I think that I th I don't know that it's a secret, but G. V. Black gave us admonitions very very early on and indicated that the professional has no right other than to be a continuous student. That single thing is what keeps us alive. If we're lifelong learners, we continue to excel and learn and grow, and that's what keeps us excited. That's what keeps us interested in dentistry. That's what keeps us interested in getting out of bed in the morning and going to the office, and it's not like going to work, it's like going to play. What do I get to do today? I think that's probably one of your highest passions is teaching. It is a huge part of it because the teacher shows up when the student's ready to learn. And who learns the most? When you go give a course or you go give a lecture 
or you're sharing information with your staff or your patients, the person that learns the very most is the teacher. So it goes in line with this lifelong learning. So speaking of that, with, um, with Horizon Dental Institute, what can the dentists who attend um, plan on taking away from your course? We have a single objective in, in Horizon Dental Institute, and that is to transfer information and knowledge that's current that allows that dentist, he or she, to go home and implement things that they've learned in a course in their very next practice day. And it's simple. We want to make a difference. We don't have anything to sell. We don't have products to sell. We're not selling anything with the exception of personal pursuit of excellence. That's awesome. Um, how many courses are you doing now per, per month or we, quarter? We, we've had a wide variety of courses and we've tried to start out slow. We kind of have a, a, a little theme of crawl, walk, run. Ultimately, we'd like to be doing courses once a month. A, okay. a two-day course, a minimum of once a month. And how can Dennis find out about this course? We have a website. We are going, we're going to obviously be utilizing social media. The biggest source, in my opinion, of, of that information gets transferred from one doctor to another. I think the very best source of marketing, which is true, proved to me to be true in practice, whatever practice location, is simply word of mouth. That drives it. That's what's driven this practice. That's driven every practice that I've been in. Today, we can't rely on simply on word of mouth but with all the social media things as well as the internet, I think the sky's the limit. I think we're only limited actually by our imagination and our energy. And with the Institute and the Pro Ergo microscopes that you're using, um, do you feel that, that um, when, the, when the dentists learn on them what you're teaching, do they go home then and typically purchase that microscope? I mean, do you find that there's that's a, a, that's a... That's a great question and I have I've asked myself that a lot recently. My goal is to not send doctors home thinking I have to buy a microscope or I have to buy a cone beam or I've got to buy gentle wave or I've got to buy something in order to practice in this fashion. Rather, I want them to understand that those things are available and when they're ready to make those purchases, that they can make those purchases. But it's more of a mindset. So it's a mindsetting and let them know that those things are available. They can utilize them if they choose to. But it's not imperative that they go home and make huge acquisitions. It's to let them see what's possible. Right. So tell us about your three best practices that you could pass on to the audience. My three best practices. Since you've been so successful and you've been doing this for so long. And you're talking, you're really referring to what are, what are the keys? Yes. Okay. What are the keys to a successful practice? Keys. Um, <clears throat> it's, I think there's one. One central key, and it's really the mantra for my practice, and, and I've utilized this wherever I've gone. It's simple. Make yourself the patient and you have the right answer. In other words, if you're in a procedure and you're wondering, should I do this or should I not do that? Well, what would I do if this was my tooth? Or what would I do if I were the patient in this particular case? and then you have that guide to guide. So you don't even have to think about it. It's, it's almost as simple as, um, I don't smoke. So if I'm someplace and somebody offers me a cigarette, I don't even have to think about it. It's like, I don't smoke. So it's mm -hmm. not even an option. Mm -hmm. When I'm in a treatment procedure and I'm wondering, what should I do here? I already know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do what's best for the patient, but pretending that I was that patient and I could treat myself. And unfortunately, I can't treat myself because I have dental needs just like everyone. Right. I, I honestly wish that that was every doctor's 
thought process. But it's the simplest thing. And I have to say that Shilder shared that with me 15 plus years ago, but it's, it's, it's just a simple guide and it works and it's successful and it brings patients in <clears throat> and patients sense it. Right. They sense what you're about and they're assessing what's going on from the moment they walk in the front door and they start meeting and greeting and how people are acting and what's the facility look like. But then yes, when they, they meet the doctor and sometimes I'll use that terminology with them. I'll just simply say, this is my philosophy. Make yourself the patient and you have the right answer. Mm -hmm. But you don't even need to say it. Patients sense it. They, they pick up on it. They Absolutely. know. And you care so much and that shows. It really does. It shows in your Sometimes whole attitude. Sometimes too much. <laughs> I know that feeling. All right, so tell us about your passion outside of the office. When you're not working 24-7, <clears throat> what, what is your greatest passion? Well, your I've family, quit, of I've course. I've quit working 24-7, and now I'm working 25-8. <laughs> okay, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> I, have, I have family, my wife, my animals. Love it. How many animals do you have these days? That's a great question. I, don't, I can't even tell you. <laughs> but I have three dogs, all blue healers, cattle dogs, and wife who's the love of my life Christine pardon me and I've got horses got mules pardon me um, it's it uh, it it's the very core of my being it's uh, I love animals and I have a lot of patients that come here and they've seen our website or something and they have literally come to this practice because they have said or they assume this guy likes animals and he likes horses and he likes dogs so i'm going to go see him so it's a good reason it's a good reason it's a good reason <laughs> being an animal lover yeah yeah well i've been an animal lover since i was a child because i grew up with animals my 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 father brought animals to the house we had dogs and we had different times other animals and uh, when I was a young teenager, I mean, even here in Arizona, I, I was living and working on a very large cattle ranch and uh, riding and roping and moving cattle, and, and I've done it ever since. Love it. That's gonna awesome. Rope, gonna rope tomorrow morning. Yeah, it keeps you young, right? Against my, against my father's best wishes. Because <laughs> he always said, Tom, be careful, your hands are your life livelihood. Um, yeah, you got to watch I, those hands. Oh boy, you got to be careful every second. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to thank you so much for this interview. You've been a 10 year plus friend of Medmark and myself, and I've been privileged to know you. And I just think you're an amazing person, and I thank you so much for well, your I, time. Well, I, you know, likewise, I think you're an amazing person, and I think what you have done with your publications is absolutely stellar. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm more than impressed. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for Great. your time. Take care. Thanks very much.